Welcome back, folks, to Contrary to Popular Wrestling. My name is Carmine Despirito, along with my co-host, my cohort, my partner in crime, James Southerd. Today, what an entertaining topic we have. Exactly, Bubba. We announced it last week. It's going to be the Iron Sheik. We're going to be talking about Sheiky Baby. You worked around him a lot. You managed him. You went overseas with him. How did you come to meet the Iron Sheik? Wow, that's a big question. I'm kind of thinking it was possibly at a Tommy Jeanette show. We used to promote Northeast Championship Wrestling up in Connecticut, New York. I believe I ran into him there for the first time. But then I, I managed him on the East Coast a few times in the New York area when I lived there. I mean, I left the uh, New York area in 92, but then I managed them overseas, and that was quite the experience, to say the least. 1993, managed them in Vienna, Austria, and <laughs> in this match, he was basically wrestling a, I forgot the kid's name, Lanny Poffo brought him. He was just like a Florida independent wrestler. Essentially, it was just going to be kind of a... A squash match, I guess you would say. But we were in Vienna. Now, I worked that room, the Stadthalle in Vienna, a few times before that. In fact, you know, I managed Hercules against the Ultimate Warrior in front of a sold-out Stadthalle crowd maybe a year prior to this. So I'm managing the Sheik. You know, he does everything. He, he does the national anthem. He used to do the Iranian national anthem. Not as great of a singer as uh, Nikolai, of course. But uh, we have a very good rapport, Sheik and I. Uh, we hang out all the time. I mean, I love being around the Sheik. Where a lot of guys were kind of apprehensive of hanging out with him. You know, I used to go out to nightclubs with him. Spent a lot of time with him. And uh, on this particular occasion, we're in Vienna, and uh, everything's going just great. You're doing everything like we always did. I'm standing at the ring, and he's yelling at me. What are you doing? What are you doing? Fucking jabroni, what are you doing? And I'm looking around like, is he talking to me? Like, what? What? Like, this is completely out of character. I've never seen him act like this towards me. And he kept yelling at me. And I said, well, there's something wrong. You know, I, I, I'm just going to stand here and not do anything. I thought maybe he thought I was taking away from his match, you know, because one thing he would do when we're in the ring and before the match, he'd say, work the people, work the people. Okay, calm down. Okay, 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 that's enough, that's enough. Okay, work the people, work the people. Okay, okay, that's enough, that's enough. Well, so I thought maybe that was going to, that was the issue. But he kept yelling at me and... It was odd, and I just stood there during the match. I didn't do a damn thing. I didn't even turn to the people. So I thought that was maybe what the problem was. Well, we get back to the locker room, and I said, Sheik, what's wrong? What, what did I do wrong? Why were you yelling at me? He said, you stand in front of promoter. They can't see Aaron Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> So I was standing in front of the promoter that was sitting at the timekeeper's table. And, you know, of course, yeah, I would block out the entire ring, of course, you know. And, and the promoter wouldn't be able to see him. As if the promoter hasn't seen him before. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, you know. It was just like, it put me in shock. Like, why is he just going off on me like this? But I had such great experiences with him. I mean, on that tour, we had both Van Hammer... And Greg the Hammer Valentine. And the Sheik started referring to Van Hammer as Big Hammer. And of course, Greg became Little Hammer. <laughs> so after a while, <laughs> Greg started getting a little fucking pissed off. Why is it that I got to be Little Hammer? And I, I've been in the business longer than him. Shouldn't I be Big Hammer? And of course, if you know me, I guess... I'm a little bit of an instigator. And I would push them for being in customs, coming back from the tour, standing in line, and <laughs> and I'd prod Sheik or Valentine or whatever, and it would get started again. It was great. It was actually a night, it was really a fun rib that went on <laughs> on that tour. One night, we're leaving the hotel, and we stayed at this beautiful resort in Vienna, Austria. And staying there was Grace Jones. I never saw her, but apparently the boys saw her, like, um, I don't know, in the sauna, in the gym, or whatever. And Van Hammer was 
bragging that that he's messing around with Grace Jones while we're staying there. Well, she took a little exception to that. That fucking jabroni, he think that he number one, he sleep with the Grace Jones. Fuck that jabroni. And one time we're in the shuttle and we're going out. We think this was probably the night before the big show. We're waiting for Van Hammer to get on the shuttle. <laughs> she just told the driver, just go. Fuck that jabroni. No reason for us to wait for him. We go. We go. And we just left him there. We didn't take him out with us. Which was probably uh, maybe for the best anyway. Because, I mean, uh, Sheiky Baby and uh, a Hammer could have gotten into it. Yeah, very entertaining being around the Sheik. He was a great guy. I can't say enough about him. After, actually, the uh, tour that we did overseas, I brought him into Milwaukee for Mid-American Wrestling. Probably 1995, I'm going to say that was. And I had a, a tag team match at the biggest show of the year, the Summer Sizzler, held at Wilson Park Stadium in Milwaukee. It was between two heel teams. It was uh, Gigolo Johnny Mercedes and Frankie DeFalco, the Sicilians, against the agency, Colonel Blatnick and Adam Pierce's favorite wrestler, the Spymaster. I had the Sheik referee the match. I mean, who better to referee a match between two heel teams than the greatest heel of all time, the Iron Sheik? And you know that Sheik started as a referee for Vern Gagne. He used to drive the ring truck, set up the ring. He'd referee and wrestle. So he started right down at the bottom. And this is a guy that trained the U.S. Olympic team. We're talking about an amateur wrestler with unbelievable credentials. But he paid his dues in the business. And one thing that he really, really... He enjoyed that booking, being in Milwaukee and refereeing, because he said, you know, this is where I started. The Midwest, this is wrestling country. This is where it all started. This is where history was made. And he's absolutely right. You know, with all the guests, James, that we have, from Eddie Sharkey to the Baron to Kenny J, the AWA guys, they will all agree that it really did start all of it. It was the catalyst. The AWA in the Midwest was the catalyst for so many great stars in the business. The Midwest in general, but especially the AWA, still, even to this day, wrestling is at its best in the Midwest. It's just they have a, a unique style and a unique perspective they bring to wrestling that makes it really like nowhere else in the country. Well, it's about the old-timers so to speak, quote-unquote, guys like Frankie DeFalco and Milwaukee that are still doing it the right way and doing these monthly shows with trainees and psychology is instilled in them. That AWA psychology that Vern Gagne developed um, and then, you know, in the independent-wise, in the, in the uh, Milwaukee area, it was handed down to Tom Stone and and now, you know, and Frankie DeFalco. So I'm happy to hear you say that about the Midwest guys, because, you know, I've got a soft spot for that part of the country, living there for so long, promoting there for so long. But just a great group of guys. Like we've said so many, so many times on this podcast, the Midwest has produced some great guys. You know, like Eddie Sharkey said, you had to be a great guy to be in the business back in his day or you weren't going to make it. Indeed, the wrestling business, really, that's what brings us all together is we're all good guys that like a similar thing there you know there are some bad guys out there but if you notice people tend not to speak highly of them and you hear everyone speak highly of people like eddie sharkey baron von raschke all those awa minnesota guys absolutely and uh, okay so back to the sheep i have him in for an independent show in milwaukee i have him at the sponsors bar after the show fans are buying him shots and i am not exaggerating he had to have 10 to 12 shots in front of him and everything was a different shot. Because you go to buy Sheik a shot, what do you want, Sheik? Whatever you want. I do whatever you drink. And, you know, he had a line of shots in front of him. Every single one of them was different. And to witness firsthand the amount of alcohol that this man can consume and still function, and I know firsthand because I experienced it, you know, as extensionally sitting right next to him, drinking with him, 
I mean, it is just incredible. I mean, of course, he had a little bit of help, you know, using some party favors to keep him uh, spry, so to speak, through the evening. But the the Sheik was really remarkable in that way. He was supposed to fly home the following morning. He befriended some local fans. They told me they were up at 3 o'clock in the morning playing bocce ball in the park with him. And he stayed for <laughs> two more nights. He had such a good time. Sheik is, is such a... A personable guy if he likes you if he respects you oh he can't do enough for you in fact back in um when i did bring him to milwaukee he brought me a gift he brought me an olympic coffee mug from well the olympics in atlanta haven't taken place yet this was two years prior for the 96 olympics and mr carmen i want to bring you gift for you and you know i'm thinking to myself God, how many people does the Iron Sheik buy a gift for, right? What a great honor. Receiving at the Olympic coffee mug from him, I mean, knowing his relationship with the Olympics, and he was in the gift shop, I'm assuming, at the airport, and saw it, and he thought to himself, I'd have bought this for Mr. Carmen. He's good friend, good friend. And, you know, I'll never, ever forget that. In fact, you know, in retrospect, I think to myself, I should have had him autograph it. That certainly would be a unique piece of wrestling history. Not too many people have an Olympic coffee mug signed by the Iron Sheik. Uh, imagine the money that would go for on eBay for all the collectors. Exactly. Sheik was a lot of fun to be around. Uh, I, I, look, at times he was a little uh, annoying. Uh, I remember one night <laughs> we were, uh, I believe it was Innsbruck, Austria, and Johnny Grunge was there in the bar with us. Whether it was uh, myself or Johnny Grunge speaking to a girl in the bar, it would just be a matter of time before Sheik would walk up. Hello, miss. Nice to meet you. Out of Sheik, former WWF champion. And he goes into his little bag. He carried around like a, uh, he had an envelope. And he'd pull out, hit his picture of me with your countryman, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Exactly. <laughs> great friend of the Iron Sheik. And he'd, you know, <laughs> completely try to get himself over and kind of be in a, excuse the language, but a cock blocker. Well, Johnny Grunge, he was fed up and he came up with this bright idea. He said, Carmine, I got the Xanax and I'm going to put in that motherfucker's beer and uh, he won't give us a problem anymore tonight. Well, I saw him put the Xanaxes in the beer. I mean, I saw him do it. And I also saw Sheik fucking just slam the bottle of beer. And I remember sitting there next to Johnny and we're just, you know, watch this, watch this. There was no effect. There's no effect at all. Nothing. In fact, if we told him what we did, he probably would have enjoyed it. He probably would have asked for like six more. I mean, there's no stopping the Sheik. He's like the Keith Richards of wrestling. After this world is done with and everybody else is gone, there will be a bunch of cockroaches, Keith Richards, and the Iron Sheik. Yes, absolutely. I, I really do. It's unbelievable. His tolerance is just uncanny. One night, we go out to a nightclub. Uh, these two fans invited us out. Myself, Sheik, and Coco Beware. Just the three of us. Uh, Coco was doing his own thing, and he was uh, talking to girls and dancing with girls on the dance floor and so on. And Sheik and I were sitting together in our own little booth, and they did bottle service. They brought us a bottle of whiskey and uh, like, a, like a two liter of Coke and a, a bucket full of ice. We're making our drinks and just having a ball. And we run out, of course. You know, we ran through that bottle pretty quick, the two of us. So we'll bring another bottle, right? And we're just basking in the glory of these, you know, these two guys. These, we thought maybe they own the club or has something to do with it or whatever. They invited us out. Well, <laughs> after the end of the night and a copious amount of alcohol, they bring us a bill. They bring us a bill. And just to see the chic when that happened. I just try. They invite us here, and then they insult the Iron Sheik and my manager, and they bring a bill? I, and he was just fired up. And I said, calm down, Sheik, calm down. We'll, we'll work out something. We'll work out something. Uh, you know, well, not a good idea um, when Sheik is fired up to kind of antagonize him more, but a fan 
<laughs> went up to Sheik and he said the words that you at no time do you ever want to say these words to the Iron Sheik. But this fan, this Austrian fan, said the words, are you ready? Hulk Hogan is number one. <laughs> And that man had a death wish. She grabbed him by the throat with one hand and lifted him off the ground. The guy was kicking his feet against the wall. He lifted him up and the kid, and she, she, come on, come on. You know, like, you know, you don't want to interfere too much because you don't want to, you know, you don't want him to get mad at you. You just want to make sure nothing escalates, you know, from there is the best thing to do. You want to kind of deflate the situation. You know, I was able to get him out of there before the cops were called or anything like that. But, you know, that's kind of like just another night out with the Sheik. Another night, <laughs> this was in Vienna. We're in the hotel. I was going to buy some hashish, which is very common there. Difficult to find marijuana, at least at the time. I don't know if it's any different now, but hashish was the drug of the day, I guess, there. I said, Sheik, I'm going to go out and get us some gimmick. Exactly, Papa. Maybe you get maybe, I don't know, get like two gram. Get two gram. Exactly. Beautiful. We smoke a little hash. Exactly. Okay, so I'll, I'll get a couple grams then. Okay. All right, Sheik, I'll be right back. Just one minute. Okay. Mr. Carmen, wait, wait. I think maybe, maybe you get maybe four gram. Get four gram. We invite the boys, you know, to the room, smoke a little bit. Eh, you get four gram. Okay, Sheik, I'll, I'll get four grams then. Four grams. Exactly. Four grams. Me, Aaron Sheik, we smoke. We have a little bit of medicine. We feel good. Then we go out. I said, oh, okay, Sheik. So I'll get four grams. Exactly. Okay, Sheik. Well, I'll be back in about probably about a half hour or so. Okay. One minute. You know, I think maybe, maybe you get, maybe, maybe you get, get eight gram. Eight gram hash. No problem. So <laughs> I ended up buying an unbelievable amount of hashish. And this is called oil can hash. It's very, very oily. And the way that you smoke it is you put it on the head of a pin, light it, and put a glass over the top of it, allow the glass to fill up with the smoke, and then you lift up the glass and you take a hit off of it. Well, we had all the boys in the room. I don't want to mention any of them. I don't want to incriminate any of them. But, I mean, everybody was, any, everybody on the show was there. We just smoked all night, drank all night. We cleared out the Sheik's mini bar. We drank every damn thing in there. And he was inviting us to do it. Have beer. No problem. Have whatever you want. No problem. Well, needless to say, this went on for hours and hours. And eventually, everybody left. <laughs> and the only one left was, you guessed it, me and Sheik were the only ones left. We had all this hash. Like, what are we going to, how are we going to, we have to get on a plane. Like, what are we going to do with this hash? She goes, in old country, we eat the hash. I go, what? We eat the hash. And yes, I ate oil can hash with the Iron Sheik. Now, it took a little bit. It probably took a good half hour, 45 minutes. But, oh, wow. When that thing kicked in, and this was probably at six o'clock in the morning, I remember I said to Sheik, Sheik, I'm going to go to my room and I'm going to get a bottle of vodka that I bought especially for him. I bought it in Warsaw, Poland the night before. I bought a bottle of Polish vodka and I wanted to bring it and share it with the Sheik. So I said, I'll be right back. So I went to my room and I just like passed out. I was out. I passed out in my room. I never made it back to Sheik's room at all. And the next thing I know, there's a knock at the door. I open the door. And it's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Hacksaw says, come on, we're getting on the bus. What? What What time is it? It's 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock? Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. It's 5 o'clock. I get on the bus. So I threw everything in my bag, you know. Got on the bus. There's Sheik. He's on the bus. Sheik, uh, how you feeling today? Perfect. Exactly. Perfect. 100%. I go, what? Wow, I've never felt worse in my life. That's probably the worst hangover I've ever experienced in my life. And here's Sheik, who come to find out 
He didn't sleep. In fact, at 7 o'clock in the morning, he went to the gym. He worked out. <laughs> he had something to eat, and there he is, sitting on the bus. Like, you know, just another night in the life of Khazra Vaziri of the Iron Sheik. It was unbelievable. I, I managed that match so hungover. I'm, I, I remember standing in the cold shower at the building and drinking coffee, slamming cups of coffee and aspirin and anything I get my hands on to perk me up. And I don't use any extracurricular drugs. I mean, a sheesh would probably be the hardest thing I'd ever use. Uh, no powder for Carmine. Just doesn't agree with me. But, you know, hanging out with the sheik, it could be a challenge. Chances are he's going to put you down. I mean, you know, I don't know anybody that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him like that. No matter what you do, you're not setting the Iron Sheik to bed, you know. He is not going to surrender and just give up. You know, you had to fight him like that on tour for a brief period of time, but our guest today, he had to fight with the Iron Sheik for 20-plus years professionally. It's your good buddy, Eric Sims. Do you think you would have survived at all if you had to deal with the Iron Sheik as long as Eric Sims did? Oh, yeah, definitely, because we had a great rapport. Sheik respected me, much like he did respect Eric. Believe it or not, I mean, you don't see necessarily that respect and that love from the Howard Stern episodes with Sheik and Eric. But believe you me, Cosro fought a lot of Eric and still does to this day, I'm sure. You know, they had a, a great relationship in that sense. Remember that there was a time when Sheik was not doing well. He had a bit of an addiction. He was in need of money. And Eric got him a lot of bookings and a lot of times had to hold his hand make sure he gets there make sure everything gets taken care of that everybody's happy i mean and that is not to say that cheek wasn't agreeable it's just that sometimes you had to babysit a little bit and you know we talked about the howard stern episodes you know one of my first times ever actually seeing eric sims was on an iron chic shoot interview and it was an absolute blast because chic was being chic he wanted little green medicine little white medicine he wanted to have a good time and he was <laughs> trying to use some contacts of eric's so we'll use that phrase there try not to incriminate anybody to receive the medicine for the iron chic and the the contacts weren't coming through and poor Eric is having to try to keep the interview on the rails while every five minutes Sheik is, Eric, my friend, have you called them? What do they say? Do they have medicine for Iron Sheik? No, Sheik, they haven't called. I, I don't know where they're doing. We, you know, we'll, we'll just do the interview and we'll talk to them afterwards. I don't feel like talking. I don't have medicine. Sheik, 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 you, you got to do the interview. They're, they're paying us for the interview. We'll, we'll do the interview. We'll go get something to eat. Then we'll go get medicine. Fine, I do. I, I do interview. I do for you. Five minutes later, same thing. Where is medicine for Aaron Sheik? Call them. It gets to the point where he is taking Eric's cell phone and calling them himself. Guy picks up. I can't come through. I've got stuff to do. Fuck you. Fuck a jabroni. Click. <laughs> and Eric... It, the man has patience of a saint. Just calmly gets Sheik. A sheep Jewish right. saint. Yes, a that. Jewish saint. And he gets him on track, and the interview goes on. And, you know, I don't know if I could have done it. And kept the Sheik on track for 20-plus years. He got him on Howard Stern, made those great appearances. Still some of the funniest segments in Howard Stern history. Without a doubt, the Iron Sheik wouldn't be as prominent as he is in the past 20 years if it hadn't been for Eric Sims of ESS Promotions. Well, with ESS, there's no BS. <laughs> There's a funny story about Sheik when he was working for WWE, when he was in the managerial role with the Sultan. That's when they first started drug testing everybody. And Sheik's drug test, you know, not surprisingly, came back positive. And the classic story is Vince confronting the Sheik about it and Sheik saying, what exactly, Mr. McMahon? Positive, exactly. I told you, I'm clean. I told you, exactly. Sheik don't use no gimmick. Exactly, Mr. McMahon. I'm positive. <laughs> he thought positive was, act was, was actually negative. What a classic. I remember one time, too, he gets to the show, and I said, Sheik, you got pictures to sell? You want to, you got any gimmicks? I said, there's a guy out there. I mean, he's got a table set up selling gimmicks. He said, he had a gimmick? He has the gimmick? I go, what? He has the gimmick. He has the medicine? 
Aaron Sheik? I said, no, 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 no. He's set up. He's selling <laughs> selling the guy's merchandise. <laughs> he thought it was medicine for Iron Sheik. He got very excited. <laughs> But I can't say enough about him. Boy, we had such a great time. So many laughs. He defended me many, many times, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into on this podcast. He treated me like his manager and never treated me like a young snot-nosed kid that I was. You know, he enjoyed hanging out with me and I enjoyed hanging out with him. Where a lot of the boys just kind of shied away from partying with the Sheik. I don't know what they were scared about. I mean, boy, it was a great time. We... We had a blast every time we went out, and we always had a story to tell. The Sheik most certainly gave plenty of people stories, but Carmine, without further ado, let's get a hold of the man who managed the Iron Sheik, Sheik's number one agent, Eric Sims from ESS Promotions, and that is no BS. He's a dear old friend of mine, a longtime buddy of mine. In fact, we've known each other Wow, going on 34 years. Doesn't that make you feel old? 30, 35. Oh, 35. <laughs> Is it 34? I think it's 35. I feel even so. older now. Ladies and gentlemen, he is known as the Iron Sheik's agent cohort you've seen him on many shows including Howard Stern and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, it's no BS with Mr. ESS himself, Eric Sims. Welcome, buddy. Hey, Carmine. How are you, bud? Glad to be on the show. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we had this idea about talking about the Sheik and telling some good Sheiky stories. I got some. I know that you've got to have a few. And uh, we're going to have some uh, other guests. 26 too. years. I've been professionally married to him for 26 years. <laughs> so, so it was, uh, and what did you it was say? Hell, I was going to tell you, it was a hell of a run. Hell, he put it me was on the a map, hell of a run. Run. It's just like yeah. I, resu- I, t- I kind of resurrected him, you know, depending on how you look at it, is, uh, you know, on top. And then when he went to the independence, it's like, you know, it was hard for him to navigate for a little bit. And then, you know, when I took over, start booking him around and doing a lot of stuff with him, it's like, it's like, it's just like, kind of resurrected him. Oh, absolutely. So. I mean, I met Sheik around the same time you did, 86. I met him around 87. Yeah. I think 87, 88, 87, 88 range. I think I, I'm probably close to 88. Somewhere in between 87 and 88. Like, I mean, correct, that's only a year. So it's like somewhere in that time range. You're not being interrogated by a Fed here, Eric. It's only me. <laughs> it, it could be 87, 88. It, it, you know, let's just go at 87. Asbury Park Convention Hall, we were just kids. And we were working with, who promoted that show exactly at Asbury Park? It was Clinky, well, well, right? Well, I did the first, I did the first one. With right. Abdullah and Schultz in a cage, and then you were managing, and we had a nice little undercard, Ted Petty, and a bunch of other people. And then when you guys, guys came back, I don't think I was partners on that one, but it was, um, then, then he had uh, Iron Sheik headlining against David Schultz. And I was there for that. I was there for that one. And, you know, they did a little, you know, around, a little, you know, a little bloodbath DQ, and a uh, good little turnout there. And, it was what it, it was what it was for back in the day. Well, no, it and, was uh, great Actually, back in the day. If I remember right, I helped uh, book the talent for that show. And you, you were um, a booker. You were the booker. I was. For the first was, one was I, I was. <laughs> yeah. You I, are. I was. I, I was a young eighteen-year-old booker. We well, had listen, somebody had the connections back then. And I, somebody I had to do it, right? Yeah. Thank I, God I for Rusty didn't have the magazine. connections back then. <laughs> You know, I was just breaking, um, I was just, I just, barely, just barely breaking into the business back then. You know, greener than shit, just trying to learn, just trying to learn the ropes, not get taken advantage, advantage too much. I remember that we had Sheik signed for the date, and we were trying to get an opponent for him. And I remember even calling Mexico City and speaking with Mil Mascaras to bring him in potentially, but that didn't pan no. out. So. No. I remember that. I thought that we were I an arm and a leg to have that work out. But right, 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 right. And then I came up with the idea, thinking about Dr. D, who has always been a heel. But I thought about, you know, he's a redneck heel. I mean, he's an all-American in that sense. I mean, he'll cut a hell of a promo on Sheik. I mean, you know, I think this could really work. I think that Schultz against Sheik it could be really hot. 
And um, I mean, of course, years later, that persona was adopted by the Stone Cold Steve Austin. So, um, yeah. and this was the first time when Schultz wrestled Sheik, the first time I ever seen Schultz as a baby face. So it was really rare for the fans to see that at the time. Yeah, yeah. I remember that match. I might, I might even have some some clips of it on video. Oh, I'd love to see that. I'm just upset though there was no video of Abdullah and Schultz in a cage. That I oh, wanted yeah. to see. That, that was that, really there was no good. video of that. Right, right. Yeah, there's some still photos of that, but there is no video. Still photos I, have, still photos I have. I just don't have the video. I don't right. think there was one. I don't think anybody shot it. You know, if, if, if we only knew back then what we know now. Exactly. You know, before we get into some uh, wild chic stories or controversial chic stories, I'd really like to emphasize, and I'm sure you you would too, that he really is a good person. And, and a good human being. He cares uh, about he, people. If he, if he knows you and likes you, he will go to the ends of the earth for you and take care of you. You know, he, he tries to kayfabe a lot, but he, like, in his kayfabe, he kinda, he's kind of teaching you. It's like kind of like really old, old, old school way. So you got to be really smart enough to kind of figure it out. It took me a long time before the light bulb went on. But once I got it, I got it. Well, I can definitely relate to that, you know, because I did some traveling with Dr. D when I was really young. And it was just like that, too. Not that he would yell at me and call me a jabroni or anything like that. But, you know, he would do things to, to mess with me. I remember one time after a show, uh, I'm going to Dr. D's car and the car is running. And, you know, he's got the windows up. They're all tinted. I can't look in. And I go up to open the door, and of course it's locked. I walk out to the other door, and you know it's locked, and I can't see in. And I know he's just sitting in there, just laughing his ass off, watching me run around the car. You know, I just thinking about Doctor D and the Sheik from Asbury Park from uh, 1987. On the way yeah. to the show, David had me bring Sheik to a rehabilitation center. And we went to go see a student of Dr. D's, a young kid, 18 years old, maybe, maybe even younger. He had a lot of promise because I remember seeing him up at Passarello's Quest in Connecticut. And unfortunately, as I remember it, he was partying with his friends, like on the back of a pickup truck, and uh, went flying off of it. The kid was really messed up, paralyzed, will be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And I'll never forget bringing Sheik there. And, of course, David was there, too. Sheik didn't play the gimmick. He started tearing up. He had to walk away, you know? It showed what type of a man he was, and it still is. Um, just a great guy. I believe that he has a big heart. I've seen him he do a lot of heart, stuff for a lot of people. Hearted, and he, when the camera's not on him, you get to see who he will shoot you. When you when the camera's on him, you get the you, know, you get the iron the character the iron. But once the camera's off and there's nothing on him, he doesn't have to show up for anybody. You get to see what the true the true man is really really about, and he's one of a kind, genuine guy. You know, there's like like he says, uh, once every hundred years they make they make a Michael Jordan, a Muhammad Ali, and an Iron Sheik, and he ain't too yes. far off from that, you know. There's no. only one I speak, and there'll never be another one. And I'll never forget telling him at a night. We were in a nightclub. We were hanging out uh, when I was overseas with him. And we were telling him, Sheik, there's only one Muhammad Ali. There's only one Joe DiMaggio. There's only one Elvis Presley. I mean, you get, I can just go on and on. And there's yeah, only yeah. one Iron Sheik. Exactly, Bubba. Exactly. Exactly. And he'd give, exactly. me, he'd give me a hug and, and like a uh, kiss I'll on the I'll tell you a wild story. Like, I, I go to pick him up at the airport. You know, and I'm, usually, I'm late or I'm circling the airport. So he has to wait for me. And, you know, he's showing off with the, with the police and this and that. Whatever. So, like, I'm, I'm there. But uh, I, I show up. It's like, oh, you're late. You're late. And he's screaming and yelling at the top of his lungs. Baggage claim. Or that curbside. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, and you know, people just like look at him like that. Don't know him. Like, imagine that someone doesn't know who the Iron Sheik is. Yes, there are people who are not wrestling fans <laughs> that don't know who he is. That he's this Middle Eastern guy, and you know, screaming and yelling and going off like a raving fucking lunatic, cursing at the police officers and the 
this and that. And they, and the cops are looking. They get him the fuck because the cops know who he is. So like they're like just playing the role too, and like you know they see me, and it's like no, the, oh, but he must be the handler, and it's like you can go now. Yeah, you can get him in the car. You can go now. And it's like fuck the police, fuck this, fuck you, fuck yeah, fuck the fuck. You're late. You're a Jerome. You're not professional. You're not ready for me to take you to see Mister McMahon. Whatever. So I'm like throwing him in the car. I'm like one for like just give him a front kick, just to get him in the fucking car. So I can close the car and just get the fuck out of the curbside so they don't ticket me or whatever. And then one time we'll, 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 we'll drive away. It's like, oh, Eric Baba, good to see you. And he gives me a kiss. I give him a kiss. You know, it's, like, oh. it's like, ah, it's like, the fucking light bulb went off. It's a fucking work. It's like, yeah, I know, you know, because I never, you know, early days, I never knew. You know, I never fucking knew. Uh, you know, I just always thought he was a fucking nutcase. But like, it's, you know, once he can't, you know, once the, once the camera's off, once he's not in the uh, Eric, Bubba, good to see you. Hey, maybe you stop at the liquor store. I, I get my uh, my beer, please. You know, you know, no, no, don't, don't have to worry about taking me to ghetto. I have someone bringing me special, uh, you know, special green medicine for iron tree. Don't, you don't worry about that. I don't know. You just take me to the liquor store so I can get the six pack of uh, Molson ice. <laughs> you know, uh, ice you know, or like the God. Saint Pauling or the backs. You know, just forget that hey, we're driving to towns, it's like and then he's like lighting up, smoking a little cannabis in the car, it's like it's hot. You, know, you you can't do it. It's illegal. You can't do that. Oh, but you you telling me I can't do that, but your president does it. Talking about Bill Clinton. Your president can do it, but it's okay for your president to do it, but it's not okay for your champion to do it. Your champion can't no cause you can't do it. I don't want I don't want the smoke in the car. Fuck you, you jabroni. I, I, I uh, uh, have a little respect for my car, oh, oh, Eric Bubba. Oh, you make me mad, but okay. Respect for my agent, my number one agent. Respect yeah. for uh, my number uh, one agent. I, 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 <laughs> you know, every time I send him home, it's like I got to aerate the car for like three days. I, was, I, I always panic driving home because, the, you know, even if he did not do any gimmick in the car, it, <laughs> his body reeked of it. Even though he, if he did smoke in the car, the body reeked of it. That like, how do you explain it to the cop? Oh, sir, your car smells of pot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, sir, but I didn't do anything. The person who I had in the car, uh, well, kind of is a pot smoker, but wasn't doing it. But his body reeked of it. But you can't go walk to him because because he's forty thousand feet in the air flying home, uh, sir. Get out of the car. Go sit down while I have the dog search the car. You want to tell me oh where it is God. now? We can get, you know, luckily, in, uh, you know, in the 26 years that I was, you know, driving around and with him, I never once was pulled over with him. Oh, wow. Never once. You're lucky. Never once. And, you know, I thank God every time. It's just like, uh, it's just sooner or later, I think my luck was going to run out. And, and even when he wasn't in the car after I dropped him off, never got stopped. And sometimes... Driving home, I was so tired. I had to stop at a rest stop. I go to the back. I go to a, a safe spot. I go to sleep just to get a little quick power nap, just so I can make make it home. I leave the windows open. You know, I was afraid. First of all, it's dangerous doing it in, in these in rest stops. You never know the people doing it there. But uh, again, I couldn't drive. I was going to danger to myself, so I needed a quick power nap so I could get home. But I was afraid the cops would, you know, come over and see me and just like, "Sir, are you okay? Have you been drinking?" You know, the whole shit that they ask. And but they did, and then oh, I, uh, what is that pot smell? What is that smell? I smell. So I step out of the car. Uh, that that never happened. I was lucky. You can't tell the sheik anything because it's like he's in his own world. He's the Iron Sheik. He's like you know, he's untouchable. Nobody's untouchable, but like he was untouchable, and it's like Sheik's way. And it's sort of, but no, it's like your agent. But you ever watch Howard Stern and Gary and this and that? You know, Gary's the inept agent that can't do anything right. He's always been made fun of. But yet, behind the scenes, he's making all the moves and, you know, controlling the puppet and the puppet's doing what he needs, what needs to be done. I, I'm being bitched at in front of the scene, but pulling all the strings and making it happen behind the scenes. That was my role for 26 years. You lived a reality show. I lived a reality show. Too bad reality shows weren't a, th weren't a popular thing. Back then, it would have been a classic. A lot of shit's documented on YouTube on all these shoot interviews done by all the different companies, all the video, kayfabe commentaries, and whoever else shot video. You, you see all our, our antics, especially on YouTube now. You could see anything with me and Sheik. I get yelled at, this and that, just like 
humiliated and whatever. And it's just all part of the act. Believe you me, it's been cracking me up for years, Eric. It's been I cracking say, me up for years. The best part about the Iron Sheik is putting him on the plane and sending him home at the end of the weekend. You know, That's the best like, part. I had a fuck. I had a fucking enough. It's just, and I keep saying I will never, ever, ever do this again. I'm fucking done. And like a fucking dumbass. Next thing you know, she's back in town for another round. Just like, why do you do it? Well, the money's good. The, the man opens doors for you. The man, you know, I'm walking down to I'm walking down to see in New York City. We're crossing the street. You know, forget the crossing at the lights and the, 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 the a fucking police officer stops traffic, stops everybody just so we can cross the street. Wow. You know, oh, there you go, Mister Sheik. There you go, Mister Sheik. There's a oh. I love, I love Iron. I love, I love the policeman. Ah, New York police, number one. Number one. Always puts him over. Always puts him over. Always, yeah, he knows how to be a worker. He knows how to work the, work everything at the right time. You know, timing is excellent. Oh, absolutely. And for a serious, and for a serious guy, he's the funniest, funniest fuck when he does his shit. Or how about we go out to eat dinner at a, at a restaurant? Oh, don't worry, Eric. I take care of the dog. Take care of them. Uh, let me sign autograph for owner. Let me sign autograph for chef. Let me sign autograph for waitress. Let me sign autograph for this person. Oh, here you go, sir. You take care. I sign for everybody. You take care. You take care of the bill. We, Eric, let's go. And the owner is so dumbfounded because he's so happy that a celebrity came in in there that, like, you know, you get a $60 meal walking out with what I'm even doing. You don't even pay for it. You know, I, had a, I, had a, I left 20 bucks on the table for the waitress. But, you know, it's like, this is this guy's livelihood. You know, this guy depends on it. We're walking away. He's giving away a free $60 meal or whatever that would cost. He had that magic to do that. The greatest oh, champion oh, of all only, time. Only him. <laughs> you yeah. know, I have, uh, I'm sure you've witnessed this too. Taking him into a gas station or a convenience store that's owned by Middle Eastern people. And they could be from anywhere in the Middle East. Not only Iranian, but they could be Iraqis, Palestinians, Israelis, Lebanese. It really wouldn't matter. I have seen these people instantly recognize him. Right. And and, and it's just amazing that, you know, he connected to a lot of people. When he spoke in Arabic and he just would say a couple lines in New York City, it really meant a lot. He connected with a lot of people. I mean, there probably wasn't oh, yeah. a cab driver oh, yeah. in New York City that yeah. didn't know him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Mecca, he was about New York City. I mean, everybody, everybody knows. Listen, he's one of the most recognizable guys, you know, for professional wrestling out there. And a lot of the 80s guys are. A lot of the guys from today, you don't. Know, you won't know, you don't, you can't recognize him walking down the street, but you know who an Iron Sheik is. You know who a Honky Tonk Man is. You know who, like, Hulk Hogan is. You know, you know, like, those, like, recognizable guys. Larger you know, than life. Piper, Larger you know, life. you know, yeah, you know, these, you can recognize these people. Here's a great story. i tell you a great story. So, I had Sheik over at my house when I was in Jersey. Uh, I met my parents, this and that. I had a take my car or my parents' car to the service station to get service for something. And then they could do it. And I said, oh, ah, you got driver's license. And so I'm in, you know, I, I used to live in a town called Marlboro in New Jersey. And it's pri primarily, it's a Jewish neighborhood. Very like white collar, proper, you know, they're more upscale than low, than low end. Okay. So with that being said, the sheik's driving the car. I'm showing him how to get to the service station. I'm trying to stay off every major highway so that, you know, just in case a cop bot goes by, he doesn't look out of place where you got a Muslim man wearing the Shalagal, which is the headpiece, driving a halfway decent car. I think it was a Mitsubishi Galant or something. I forget what it was. But, you know, he's driving through. So I'm going through all these back roads to get there. And I'm like, you know, and he's driving like, you know, just hopefully he didn't bang into my car, you know, while we get there. And he's driving, you know, and it's doing okay, but we're in the Charlotte Gal. He looked completely out of place. I'm like cracking up, just driving a car, to, you know, hoping that the cops don't stop him. Because he's like, you know, it's like, you know, being the wrong person driving through Bel Air in California. You know, they, they'll stop you if you, like, you know, 
if you're out of place over there, you know, if you, you belong in, you know, South Central and you're, and you're in Bel Air, they'll, right. they'll kind of figure it out and question, question you. You know, I don't want to be questioned. You have to stay a little yeah. undercover with the sheik. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep it on the D low. It, it was the funniest thing ever watching him watching him drive. We made it there safely. Everything was good, but it was just fucking hilarious. Just hilarious. You know, driving through the you know the the rich Mar you know the rich Marlboro town full of you know just, you know Jews. Not not I say that Jews or whatever, but like a mix of. You know the, the Jewish population there, and it's like, sure. wow. I, and just speaking of that, you know, when I met him, you know, he's an Arab, uh, you know, Persian. I'm a, you know, I'm Jewish descent, and, and you know, the Jews and the Arabs are not supposed to get along with each other, but you know, they're supposed to hate each other. But we got somehow we got along, and we got along for a long time. You know, the, you know, it's kind of like his, you know, on the road, his caretaker back, you know, you know, on the road. You know, outside of being his, you know, agent, friend, and confidant, and whatever. So interesting time. You had to be really paranoid when he got in the driver's seat. Knowing you, you had to be uh, just. Yeah. You had to be going out of your mind. The anxiety. You had to be. <laughs> oh, I mean, every time he came in, it was, like, it was anxiety. Oh my god! It was just like, oh, here's another one. I'm at I'm at a convention in, in Long Island. Yo, know, it's done, and I got to get to a show in New Jersey. And I had my my girlfriend move my wife now, my girlfriend, and and there, and, you know, she saw the promoter who had a limo, who had want the want the chick to go in a limo so he can do a little. <clears throat> and a little gimmick, I little told medicine. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I told him, we got to go. We don't time. We don't time for this. It's like uh, Eric Bubba. I think I left my hat downstairs. Well, can you? Can you go downstairs and um, <laughs> check if I check my hat? It's the distraction technique. But this time I had my girlfriend with me. And my girlfriend, if, and, you know, I said, don't let him out of your sight. You keep make sure he stays by the car, gets in the car. You keep him You keep, you keep him there. She's a pit bull. My wife is a pit bull. She listened to me perfectly. Because when I came up, they're making a scene in the, in the parking lot. Yeah, she and him screaming at each other at the top of their lungs because my wife wouldn't let him get into the car with the guy because I knew what was going on. Oh, and, you know, they're just like <laughs> cursing and this and that. Like, what do I do? Do I protect my client or do I defend my girlfriend? And hey, don't don't talk about my girlfriend like that. You know, to to my girlfriend like that. So I finally got him in the car to get him you know, after bitching and moaning at each other. And then my wife, you know, it's me or him. You know, you know, you can allow him to talk to me like this. I'm like, what the fuck? I just want to get to my job. So it's like, wait till everybody calms down. And then I made him apologize to her. And then, okay, now you apologize to him. Let's just settle it down and let's, let's get some business done. You know, let's get to this. Let's make, let's just make it to the show. That was just like another outing with the Sheik, another day in the life, Eric and the Iron Sheik. Okay. Were there any times yeah. that he was really difficult and you wanted him to do something, but he was refusing? No, he always did what I asked him. He kind of always did what I asked him. So, I mean, he was good like that. Yeah. It's just getting, just getting him there when he wanted to do something else. Like, you know, <clears throat> little this, little that, you know, a little bit of gimmick. Well, everybody that knows my, my system, when you come in and work for me is, you know, I bring you in and I load you up and I keep you as busy as humanly possible for the, for the weekend. And, you know, we all make some money. I remember once seeing him, Mr. Carmen, so great to see you. You know, maybe you find medicine for Aaron Sheik, maybe some white gimmick or the brown gimmick. I still don't know what he meant by the brown gimmick. But, uh, <laughs> a little, little hard, a little soft, you know, little you know, bit, coca, exactly. which is like cocaine and uh, cocaine and, uh, and marijuana, you know, hard and soft. And right, hard and soft, like, right. Yep, yep, yep. And, and it's like, oh, fuck. How about Howard Stern? The first appearance on Howard Stern had so, to be so a nail how, biter so how for that, you. How that worked out was I had him in town. We were promoting something. I forget what we were promoting. Uh, convention or something we were at. So I get him on Pharrell, the sports guy on Howard Second Station 101 on the Sirius XM. You know, everybody heard of Sheik and his rant. So they got him on Pharrell to promote stuff. And like he went crazy with a bunch of different stuff. They saved the tapes. They got it over to Stern. Uh, and like three weeks later, I got the call from the Stern show saying, we want him. So, oh, okay. 
Excellent. So we set the date up, this and that. I had him come in special, you know, come in, get ready for the thing. And to me, Howard Stern, this is a guy I've listened to like all my life. And it's like, oh, yeah. Hey, if you're not a Howard Stern fan, you know, I mean, everybody's, for most everybody's a Howard Stern fan. And if you know Howard Stern, it's whatever. It's like the biggest thing ever. It's like the biggest media forum ever outside of TV or like, you know, regular stuff, but for what it is. So like, I wanted to protect the Iron Sheik at all costs. I basically shut him off from the rest of the world. After we ate our dinner, went to the hotel. I put him in complete lockdown. There was nobody in, nobody out, no phone calls, nothing. I shut everything off. He did nothing. I made sure he went to sleep, got good sleep. We left at 536 in the morning, our whole caravan. And we went to the city. We did the show. It went over great. Met the staff. We had everything. Howard was great. I didn't make it on to the show the first time, but you know, between 2007 and 2009, we did the show, I believe four times. And I, and, and I was on the second, third and fourth time I made it into the studio. You know, they, 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 as, as the, as I think they figured out later on, later times that we're on that, like I'm part of the act. You know what I'm saying? I'm, you know, right, you're part of the show. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm the, I'm the, equa- I, you know, I'm the equation. I'm the Gary to the Howard. You understand? Uh, you know, yes. that's the thing, you know, this how I got Howard. I always mocks Gary gets on him for this or that. And Gary's stupid and inept and this and that, but really behind the scenes, it's just, he's a smart guy that pulls all the strings and makes everything work. And I did the exact same thing with the Sheik. And I knew like how to play the dumb, the dumb agent that's in that, that can't get anything done, that fucks everything up. But behind the scenes, I'm all business taking care of everything. Oh, absolutely. On the first episode of the Howard Stern show, was he drinking beer? Did he ask for beer on that episode? Yep, yeah, yeah, he did beer. They had they had art they had Artie do his impersonations. They had Richard and Sal as uh, like Macho Man and Ultimate Warrior and this and that. It, it was funny and he played he played anal ring toss with Bubba the Love Sponge and some chick. I mean, it was, and he won, and Iron Sheik won anal ring toss. <laughs> now, if anybody that doesn't know anal ring toss, so you have you have a girl bending over, and there's like a spike coming out of her ass or whatever the hell it is, and you have to toss a ring onto her ass called anal ring toss. And it's like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, this is, uh, this is interesting. It's like, uh, you know, how the fuck am I going to sell this? But, uh, okay, not for me to sell it. It's Howard Stern show. The God, they could do anything they fucking want. Howard Stern was like God in New York for, uh, you know, oh, crying yeah. out loud. And it got all over the country. so huge. I've watched some of the episodes recently of The Iron Sheik and Howard Stern and you, yeah. of course, he gets uh, all fired up when they call him and rib him and act like the Ultimate Warrior, a Hulk Hogan, and you know he just goes out of his mind and he, he's cussing and of course you know that f- blonde Hulk Hogan and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. So he's all fired up, and I've always wondered when you guys left, what was it like then? What, how was he feeling? Was he what was he like then? Was he still uh, all it fired fine. up? It was fine. It no, was he- fine. It's, it's, all, it's all an act. It's all this and that. Oh, Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad. Let's go, Eric. Oh, oh, get to the car. Get me a beer, please. Thank you. Just get me a beer. Oh, he also he always drank in the car, too. I was fucking panicking about the, about the drinking in the car because I could. that's illegal. I could get arrested for that. I could probably, Even though I'm the driver, I never drank, and he's the passenger. I don't know how the laws are, but... You know, they, they bust him, but I don't know if I could lose my license or get my car impounded because of that. You know, it's just. It, but that, that, you've it's always never, been a law-abiding citizen, Eric. You've always uh, been a law-abiding. Well, I, citizen. I try. I try to be. I mean, you know, it's like someone has to steer the ship. You know, if I don't steer the ship, nobody makes money. That's right. You've always been an honest agent, an honest guy in the business. Um, you know, if anybody, people have. You know, they've asked me about you through our. 30 years that we've known each other and you know i've always put you over i said there isn't a guy alive that can say anything negative about him i said eric has always treated guys right but just like in any type of business you have disagreements and you always make shit right with these guys or at least try to and i think that you know in this business in all honesty you've been a true asset eric you've gotten uh, a lot of guys work you continue to get them work continue to get them paydays you know it's it's funny. I grew up watching and idolizing these guys uh, as a child. And, you know, 
back in 1977, I was watching it on television. A friend of mine at school said, let's watch the old Channel 9 in New York and then back to versus Valentine at the, you know, at the garden, you know, back in 77 or whenever it was. And, you know, it's like, I'm watching this and I'm thinking, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Fast forward to 85, I'm breaking in into the business and 35 years later, I, I'm still here. Now, I don't do it full time, but it's a good secondary income for me. And I've made a decent business for myself with my ESS promotions company. And, and the guys that I grew up idolizing and, you know, watching on TV, I now get to work and I'm able to give back to them for all they gave to me, you know, by the joy, enjoyment of watching. Now I get to give back to them by booking them and helping them, you know, after their, you know, heydays are over and put money in their pocket and it's been a good, so we're going to put a partnership, good relationship with some of these guys and just doing business. And, you know, uh, I guess I'm like one of the OGs of doing this and I've built a, built a decent reputation doing that. And hopefully now my, not old, but like, you know, all my experience, I can, you know, pass it down to other, the newer people coming up and hopefully they can do, you know, lead the way like I led the way, you know, the problem is they just don't have, they don't have the true old school teachings of how guys from back then taught because of the newer generation, they don't, know it like the, the old school people like oh you know, definitely totally, definitely totally, it, totally different totally different but you know it, it's up to me to get the next generation ready and you know uh, hopefully i can do that well the sheik the was your main for client for many many years who are you representing now i got val venus i got uh, demolition still i got who the speed cake comes in for me every once in a while uh yeah, I got Savio Vega coming up. I got Rock and Roll coming up. Tommy Dreamer I use every so often. Sandman. It's like a the roulette wheel. You know, it's a big wheel. I spin the wheel, and if your name comes up, your name comes up. Deal with about 80 to 100 guys all on a rotating basis. So it's whoever the promoter wants is who I get or, you know, whoever I choose to bring in. Now, I've seen your Facebook Live shows that you've done where you've done auctions, auctioning off some autographed pictures, and... You're really fair. You give the fans some great prices on these items, and I think it's just great what you do. Uh, Where can you know, people? I try not to take advantage. You know, luckily the this COVID, this pandemic, pretty much saved a lot of these wrestling vendors' careers because nobody was making any money. You know, very few of us were making any doing anything. Now all of a sudden, you get to stay home, do this virtual stuff that nobody even thought about way back. You know, before this pandemic hit because it just wasn't a thing. Everything was all live events and whatever. And when everybody's lo locked down, that's the only thing you could do with these virtual things. And people just cashed in on it. And, it, you know, I got to say, I, did, I you know, without mentioning numbers, I, I've done very, very well in a very short period of time. I hope so, the IRS isn't lucky. listening, Eric. <laughs> I think it's great. You give the fans a lot of good deals. You do, like, package deals where essentially an autographed picture, God, costs, like, less than 10 bucks. I mean, how can you go wrong? Where can people find this merchandise if they're not able to see on Facebook Live? How can they contact you? Well, you know, I got a website. It's esspromotions.com. You just go to the World Wide Web, and I'm at esspromotions.com. And for those who have Facebook, I'm on Facebook at Eric Sims or uh, my business page, ESS Promotions LLC. I'm on Twitter at ESS. 316, I'm on Instagram at ESS316. I'm on YouTube. I got a bunch of videos. Just put in Eric Sims or ESS316, and you'll be able to find all that stuff all over my social media. And if any of the listeners are trying to build their wrestling autograph collection, it's a must for you to get in contact with Eric. Everything is authentic. Every single piece. I'll stand behind Eric and his inventory because I know what kind of a stand-up guy he is. And it's a great opportunity for wrestling fans to get a lot of autographs from a lot of different personalities they wouldn't have a chance to meet in person. Exactly right. You know, we go to great, like me and other vendors, we go to great lengths to get autographs from these talent, from the talent. And it's all authentic. I mean, uh, like, so everything I do is authentic. I don't deal with uh, fame. I want to fill your uh, needs, wants, and desires by selling my photos. And if it's something you like, you know, uh, most likely I have it or can get it. That's it. And you just, just contact me either. 
through the website, uh, through Facebook, with Eric Sims. Do you have any Iron Sheik merchandise in stock? I have a photos. I have some Iron Sheik photos. My colleague and partner did a private signing with him uh, not too recently, and I got some merchandise off of that. So, uh, yeah, I got, I got, I got my, I got my lot of um, Iron Sheik photos. Which I'm sitting on, you know, until the time's right, and then I'll sell them. Listeners, once again, contact Eric for all your wrestling autograph needs. And going on, speaking about the Iron Sheik, how you think Iron Sheik wants to be remembered? I think Iron Sheik wants to be remembered as a great athlete, good to his fans, and just a solid performer. Yeah. That was always good to his fans. Even though he played the bad guy, villain, he's really a baby face in life despite all his demons the drinking the you know the, the, the drugs or whatever but if you get past all that and the, and the character and whatever sober and clean he's an awesome guy he's a really good kind-hearted guy i've never seen him turn down anybody for an autograph especially a child i've never, never seen that in my never, life ever. in fact right she wants to sign for everybody Everybody and anybody. I was on tour with him in Austria, and I was managing him. And I was getting on the tour bus, and um, I was signing some autographs for the fans that were waiting outside. As I got on the bus, Butch Reed yelled out, Come on, you're nothing but a mark. You're nothing but a mark signing those autographs for those fans. Sheik stood up from the back of the bus. I'll never forget it. And he said, Carmine is my manager. He signed autograph. He no mark. He my manager. And fuck, he got really fucking fired up and sat down with me. Don't fucking listen to him. Does he ever wrestle main event Madison Square Garden? Is he the greatest heel of all time? No. I don't sheet number one. Fuck him. And I'll never forget <laughs> yeah. that. He defended me. Yeah. And it's one of the many times that actually that we'll get into later in the podcast, but he stood up for me and defended me and never treated me like a jabroni, never treated me like a young kid that I was. He respected me because he knew that I respected him. And I think that's what it's all about with him. It's very old school. Just like you said in the beginning, Eric, show the chic respect and he'll respect you back. Exactly. Exactly, Bubba. A to the Z. Exactly, Bubba. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for being on the podcast, my old dear well, okay. friend. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be on here, and uh, hopefully we'll do it again soon, because I had a lot of fun talking about the Iron Sheik. If it wasn't for the Iron Sheik, there'd be no ESS, or no, no Eric Sims in wrestling. He's the guy that put me on the map, and I owe everything to the Iron Sheik. And remember, listeners, with ESS, it's no, no BS. No BS, exactly. A huge thank you to ESS himself, Eric Sims. <laughs> Man, some of those stories are great. Uh, again, I just, I don't know if I could have survived hanging out with the Iron Sheik, but it sounds like an absolute blast. Tell you what, sometimes it's tough hanging out with Eric Sims. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I've known Eric, God, for so long, really, and uh, he is a stand-up guy. I can't say enough about Eric. You know, he's honest. He's done great business with so many of the legends and uh, put some extra money in their pockets and, of course, his. But uh, he is definitely a tribute to the business. I can't say enough about Eric. He has my endorsement 110%. Before we sign off, there's a couple other little stories I want to bring up involving Nikolai. Stories that my dear old friend Nikolai Volkov uh, told me about Sheik. For one, you know, Sheik was a devout Muslim and very, very clean. So when they would share a room together in the middle of the night, you know, Nikolai never went out and party. So he'd wait for Sheik to get back to the room and Sheik come back all messed up, wait until Sheik started to fall asleep. And then Nikolai, who uh, not only could impersonate a horse like none other, made the greatest farting sound you could ever imagine. So as Sheik is sleeping, just imagine this, the, the, the room is dark, and Nikolai makes this <laughs> sound, not even close to as good as how Nikolai would do it. And then Sheik would wake up, fucking Nikolai. And he'd run to the shower. He'd take a shower, Sheik, and he'd get back in the bed. And then Nikolai would wait about another 20 minutes. 
and then break out another one. <laughs> Fucking Nikolai, you motherfucker. And, get, and take another shower. <laughs> and Nikolai can do this all night long. <laughs> and just rip him all night long doing this over and over again. There were many times, Nikolai said, that they would tape a radio interview. And a lot of times they had to tape this early in the morning. Well, of course, you know, shiki has been out all night, so he's not up. You know, he would sleep late. Well, Nikolai would do the radio interview and do both voices. He would do... <laughs> like he would, do, of course, you know. And then my, my tag team partner, the Iron Sheik, uh, you know, exactly, exactly, Nikolai. And <laughs> Nikolai and Sheik would be driving in the car and have the radio on. And then the interview would come on and Sheik would be looking at him. And he, he wouldn't say anything, but, you know, thinking to himself, he doesn't remember doing this interview. And that's something Nikolai did to him for years and years I wish we could find some old radio interviews with the Sheik and Nikolai because, well, nine times out of ten, wasn't the Iron Sheik. It was Nikolai doing both voices. You know there's somebody out there listening to this going, wait a minute, was that really the Iron Sheik and Nikolai I heard on my local radio station? Odds are, probably wasn't. Yeah, more than likely, it wasn't. You know, Sheik was always a pleasure to be around and uh, a good person. I sincerely saw that out of him. He's a caring man. You know, like Eric Sims said, if he had your respect, you were like family. And as Eric said, Sheik would create a scene, whatever it might be, maybe at the airport with the police or something like that. Then when they get back to the car, oh, that was beautiful, Baba. And, you know, and, and give Eric a kiss on the cheek, just like he did with me so many times. I just adore the man, and I hope he's doing well. I understand that he is. His family is limiting the amount of appearances that he's doing. I would love to see him again. He means the world to me. He really, really does. Anytime he's seen me, there was one time at the Cauliflower Alley, they were filming a documentary about him. And he didn't know I was going to be there. I was standing off to the side of the camera, and he sees me. And he pulls me into the camera view. My manager, Mr. Kahneman, I'm so happy to see you. You know, and I cut a promo into the camera, putting him over. He always loved when I would say, there's only one Muhammad Ali, one Joe DiMaggio, one Elvis Presley, and one Iron Sheik. Exactly, Bubba. A to the Z. Without a doubt, there is only one Iron Sheik. We'll never see another like him. We sincerely hope that everybody enjoyed hearing your stories about the Sheik, hearing Eric Sims reminisce about working with the Sheik. The Sheik is one of a kind, and I think we did right by him in doing this and sharing some of the legendary stories, and there's many more like him. We could probably do an entire podcast dedicated to the Iron Sheik just week after week of Sheik stories. But, Carmine, you know, you're going to be gone next week. You're going to be down on Kayfabe Island in parts unknown, enjoying a little vacation. So we are going to re-release the untold stories of the AWA in their entirety. Parts 1, 2, and 3, back to back to back. You can listen to it all, hear from people like Baron Von Raschke, Kenny J, Frankie DeFalco, all of the great guests we had on that series. You will hear that next week next Sunday night into Monday morning at midnight on YouTube, Facebook, your favorite podcast platforms. They'll be there, and you can hear it all in its entirety. And we will be back when you've returned from vacation. And who knows, you might come back from vacation with a brand new idea. You'll have to stay tuned to our Facebook page to keep up with what we're going to be doing next on Contrary to Popular Wrestling. For all the listeners out there, hey, send us your questions or your ideas for an upcoming podcast. We want to hear from you fans. We want your input. We want this to be a fan interactive podcast. It's very fan friendly. So please communicate with us, folks. Indeed, it's always great to hear from fans with ideas, or hell, we might even have you on the show. We had Mike Wilson on to share a story from the AWA. That's what we want to do. We, At the end of the day, we're all fans. 
that's what made us love wrestling and so it's great to get to interact and share our experiences as fans you can send those stories questions comments topic suggestions you can find us on facebook contrary to popular wrestling facebook.com slash contrary pod you can email us at contrary pod at gmail.com be sure also and subscribe to us on youtube our youtube channel where we put together videos to go along with each episode and you can also subscribe to us and please leave a positive rating on all your favorite podcast platforms whether that be apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher do that it helps us out so much well carmine if we've got nothing else to say i guess we will see everyone next week on contrary to popular wrestling and i'm going to the beach